All right, good morning, everyone. My name's Jesse Hildebrand, and welcome to another exciting edition of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today, I'm excited to say we're joined live by three classrooms from around North America. We might get two more a little later, but I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. First, we have Miss Furnival's class. Miss Miss Furnival's class. Well, well. Okay. And then we've got Ms. Golchinski's class from Watona, Wisconsin. <laughs> We're also joined by uh, Ms. Paquette and Ms. Dorado's class in Peel. Uh, their mic and video aren't working, but they can see this and they'll ask questions a little later. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tammy at Sankop, joining us live from South Africa. She's got Steve and Nona today, so wonderful penguins, and she will uh, share her love for what she does with you guys. Thanks so much for being with us here today. All right, so hi guys, my name is Tammy. I'm the education manager at Sankop. I'm calling you from Cape Town, South Africa. I am very, very, very sick today, so I do don't I uh, look like I haven't slept in two days because I haven't I've got a really bad tummy bug I'm sorry but I am here and I'm a teacher just like your teacher which is why I'm here you see teachers they make their way to school when they get sick because they don't want their kids to miss out uh, but I don't actually work in a school I work in a hospital and I mostly work with these guys hey so this is Steve everyone wave hi to Steve hi Steve Oh, I see us all waving. There we go. Steve is blown away. Thank you all for waving. Um, so Steve is an endangered, and Steve is here today to teach us a little bit more about penguins and Cape Town and South Africa and sand cob and all these cool things. But before I jump into my lesson, I just want to show you some cool things while we've got our real penguin in front of us. The first one is you'll see that Steve has these spots on his tummy. So all African penguins, yes, we hear you, you're very noisy and sweet, yes. All African penguins have these spots on their tummy, um, but none of them have the same spot. So it's like a fingerprint. It's something that makes them unique. You'll also see Steve has beautiful big feet, gorgeous, very nice. You'll see they're webbed. This helps him with his swimming. Um, you'll also notice if we bring our camera a little bit closer and I open Steve's mouth. You'll see that Steve doesn't have teeth. Instead, he's got this long bladed tongue, which helps him swallow his fish whole. Um, so Steve actually doesn't chew up his food at all, like some other animals would. Instead, it just goes gulp in one big go, and he gets all this fish. <laughs> oh, see, it's because I'm talking about fish. He's like, don't talk about fish. I'm going to start going crazy. Um, so we're going to learn a lot today. It's going to be really, really cool. Steve is excited. You can see these flippers are up in the air. They're like, yes, let's get ready to learn. Something about his flippers actually is that they're quite flexible. You see, they can even touch at the back. You see his face is quite relaxed. It's like, oh, that was fine. Um, so we tend to think that flippers would just be ugh, like completely still at the side, but they're actually quite flexible. They can move around. Anyway, so like I was saying, Let's go on to our actual lesson, which is about Steve. It's going to be great. Yes, it's going to be great, and we're going to learn a little bit more about him. So to do this, I've got to share my screen with you. All right. I want to see a big thumbs up from everyone when you can see my screen. Okay, I'm seeing some thumbs. Awesome. So we're here today to meet Steve and Nona the friendliest penguins at Sand Cobb. So you might be thinking, what on earth is Sand Cobb? Uh, well, Sand Cobb is the name of the hospital where I work. It stands for the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds. It's a really, really, really long name, and no one ever gets it right. So I don't come to work and I say, oh, hello, fellow co-worker at the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds. Like, no one ever, ever gets the full name right. So instead, people just call us San Cop. Much, much quicker. I'm calling you from Cape Town in South Africa. This is a picture of the city where I live. It's really beautiful. And people come from all over the world, mostly to visit us because of that mountain. So the mountain is called Table Mountain, um, and it's called that because it basically just looks like this big table. It's really flat on the top. People can even catch a cable car 
to the top of it there and uh, walk around the top of the mountain to behold the beauty that is the city. So if you ever do come and visit us in Cape Town, uh, you'll probably have quite a good time and get a chance to go up. We also uh, do a couple things at Sankov, namely oil spill response. So this is when we get birds in that have oil on their feathers um, and we wash it off and release them back into the wild as well as veterinary medicine. So hands up, who knows what a vet is? Who in our classes know what a vet is? Oh good, I'm seeing some hands. Um, so some of you might be thinking things along, a vet is someone that helps animals. A vet is someone that makes animals better. A vet is an animal doctor. And one day if you study to become a vet, you would study veterinary medicine. So we do a lot of veterinary medicine work at Sankov as well. What keeps us busiest though is chick rearing and you're not going to hear any sound. Don't worry, I, I'm talking over her. Um, this is from a South African news broadcast and she's speaking about the start of chick season here at Sankob. Now, um, Sankob works with hundreds of chicks that come in every year abandoned. Some of these come in as eggs. These eggs are collected from nests that are outside the protected area of the colony, or they're in the protected area of the colony, but the eggs have been abandoned by mom or dad penguin. So the, the mom or dad penguin isn't there to sit on the egg to help hatch it. Once the chick hatches at sand cob, it's very small, about the size from the top of your nose to your chin. Um, and then it's gonna go into one of these little buckets in an incubator. The woman you see on the screen, her name is Romy. And Romy is basically a penguin mom for a living. Her job is to make sure that these penguins grow up to be big and strong. You'll see that when she feeds them, she's even sure to wipe their beaks and their bottoms so that they're nice and healthy. Once enough time has passed, this chick will be released back into the wild as a much older penguin. You'll see in our video that there's some penguins that are being released out of a box onto the beach and they're waddling their way back down to the ocean and freedom. You'll also notice these guys are walking on a beach. They're not working or walking on the ice or in the snow. And that's because the penguins that live in my country don't live in the snow. They live where it's warm and sunny. Great, so um, that's me talking for about nine minutes, which is definitely long enough for anyone to be listening to me talking for nine minutes. So what we're gonna do now is to have a little bit of a break from my voice and to um, get to learn a little bit more about African penguins and their behaviors. I'd like us all to play a game together. So I want all of my classes to stand up together. So I'm gonna stand up too. Let's all stand up together. Great. I see all these little moving bodies, wonderful. Oh, just gonna wipe this off my floor. There's a big penguin poop on my floor. Yeah, let me wipe that away. All right, so little penguins, we're all standing up together in our classes and we are a colony of penguins. So how you get a flock of sheep, you get a colony of penguins. Now, I'd like us to please put our flippers at our sides. I want your flippers at your sides, please. Very good. And we're going to get a chance to waddle around. So, penguins, flippers at your sides, and let's waddle around our classes. Off you go. And remember, don't just waddle in your nest. You've got the whole beach. So, let's move around. Good, I'm seeing some waddling. All right, stop little penguins, we're stuck on a rock. Now, African penguins, if they wanna get off a rock, they're gonna jump, but we can't really bend our knees and then jump like that. Our knees don't work that well. So we've gotta keep our legs as straight as we can and then we push ourselves off the rock. So it's kind of like a yeah, kind of jump. So let's try to do this on three, jump off of our rock. One, two, three, yeah, oh, very good. Okay, keep waddling guys. Well done, those were some good waddles.
All right, stop, little penguins. You have found a penguin friend. Now, when African penguins are friends, they do something called preening. They take their beak. So everyone take your beak for me, please. I want to see them beaks. Nice. Now, let's preen our friends. So we need to go up to our penguin friend and clean their feathers. Very good. I see some good feather cleaning there. Well done. All right, excellent guys. Stop little penguins. We have come across a kelp gull. Little penguins, we have come across a kelp gull. Now, kelp gull is a large type of seagull, very much because they tend to steal our eggs. They pick up our eggs, fly high in the sky, and then they drop them and they eat whatever's on the inside. So we want this kelp gull to leave us alone. We, we don't want this kelp gull near us or near our eggs. So we need to bray to get the kelp girl to leave us alone. So a cat meows, a cow moos, an African penguin brays. It's kind of like a rah, hee -haw, rah, kind of noise. And right in the middle of it is this hee -haw, like a donkey kind of weird sound. So let's practice our bray together on three. One, two, three. Rah, hee -haw, rah. Very good. Very, very good. Now, what I'm going to do, little penguins, is I'm going to sit down and I want to hear you guys brain from wherever you are in the world. So I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen, and I want to hear you brain so loud that the cup bell leaves us alone. So on three, 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 one, one. Ready? Three. Dashing us to pray on three. Ready? Right? Yeah. Yeah. That was the loudest bray I've ever heard. That's the first time I braid with so many classes together. You guys did amazing. Steve was so impressed. He couldn't even believe it. Hey, Steve. Yes. There was his own little bray. He was saying, that was great, guys. Well done. Yes, very, very good. Okay, so now that we've had a, a little bit of a game, let's jump back into our lesson. I'm going to share my screen with you again. I want to see that nice big thumbs up when you can see my screen. All right, I see those thumbs. So, hi, I'm Steve, and I'm an endangered African penguin. Now, this is a very, very important word. If an animal is endangered, it means there aren't many of them left. We're running out of that type of animal. They're nearly all gone. My feathers are brown, but soon I'll get my tuxedo. And I'm a handsome boy. Then if we go to our next page, we see, hi, I'm Nona. I like to eat sardines. Now, Nona's a seabird. This means she lives by the sea, and her food comes from the ocean. She loves sardines, but she also enjoys mackerel and poultrys. I look like I'm wearing a tuxedo. So you'll see she's very snazzy in her black and white feathers. She looks like she's got a little tuxedo on. And I'm a beautiful girl. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Steve's feathers are brown. Nona's feathers are black and white. It must be because Steve's a boy and Nona's a girl. Well, that's not true. In this case, it's because Steve is younger than Nona. You see, as soon as Steve turns two years old, he will get his little tuxedo feathers like Nona. Now, Steve and Nona came to Sand Cobb because they are tame. Kind of like our cat or dog at home. So hands up, who in our, who in our classes have pets? All right, I do see some hands there. Very good. So you guys, you probably have pets like cats, dogs, hamsters, guinea pigs. But none of us have pets like kangaroos or lions or cougars or badgers or penguins as pets because it's quite dangerous for us to keep these animals as pets and they probably wouldn't like it much either. But Steve and Nona, they're a little different. They kind of are like pets that you could have at home. They are very tame. Now this means that Steve and Nona are not scared of people and it changes how they hunt. You see, a wild penguin will go hunting in the ocean for fish, but Steve and Nona will look for a person to give them food. 
So if I released Steve back into the wild today, he wouldn't go looking for his own food. He'd go looking for someone to give him food. And he'd say, excuse me, can I have some fish, please? And uh, that's, not, that's not very safe for Steve to do. Steve and Nona actually came to Sand Cobb very tame. This most likely happened because someone fed them or approached them in the wild. And this leads us to three important lessons when we are out in nature. We must remember to, number one, leave things how we found them. Remember, when you are outside, you are in an animal's home. If you remove something, you could be taking a piece of furniture that's in that animal's house, something it needs to survive. Number two, do not approach wild animals. Going up to wild animals is really dangerous. You could get hurt or they could get hurt. It's just not a good idea. And lastly, do not feed wild animals. Remember, when we go up to wild animals and we feed them, we are teaching them that they can go up to a person to get food instead of hunting for their own food. And when animals don't hunt for their own food, it impacts the entire food chain that they are a part of. So thank you. That's a very, very short look as to why Steve and Nona are here at the hospital. Um, and again, that's, that's me having uh, spoken for another couple of minutes. So what we're going to do now... Oh, sorry. Steve just had a big penguin poop on my laptop bag. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a chance to go outside into the hospital. I'm going to walk around so I can show you where Steve and Nona live. Would you like to see? Oh, yes. I think that would be cool. I think let's see that. So I'm going to pop Steve here. You can just nest here for now. There we go, Steve. And let's head out into the hospital. So I'm going to start walking around with this laptop. All right, and out we go. Oh, hold on. You're just looking at bottles of water. That's not helpful. Okay, out we go. All right, so this is the inside of the hospital. It's about five o'clock in South Africa now, so people are starting to get ready to go home after a long working day. Hello. All right, if we head outside, you'll see just above us is this netting. The netting is actually here to help us with mosquitoes. The mosquitoes in South Africa, they can carry an illness called avian malaria. So if they bite our penguins, they can make them really sick. Heading down, I see a bird walking towards me. Her name is Ebony. Ebony's a bank cormorant. And she's absolutely beautiful. There are only about 500 bank cormorants left in my country. So we're very, very lucky to get so close to her. She's saying, oh, hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. Then I see a whole bunch of penguins swimming. We are so lucky. Right, so these guys that are swimming in the pool, we're not teaching them how to swim. They already know how to do that. We are having them swim to improve the quality of their feathers. You see, penguins' feathers are very important because they need them to be waterproof in order to swim in the ocean. It's kind of like a little wetsuit, so they can swim in the ocean for a while and not get cold. Right, it seems like they're opening the gate here, so a bunch of penguins are going to walk in, which is actually quite cool to see. So you see, everyone's been having their little zip, and they're going to open the gate. And all our little penguins start coming out, and they're saying, okay, it's our turn to go inside now. We've had our swim. So there's just this one little guy on the side, and he's like, I'm not done swimming. I want to stay in the pool. All right, then on this side, this is where Steve and Nona live. This is home pen. Home pen is for our long-term patients or our permanent residences. So the penguins that live here or the penguins that are visiting the hospital for a long time, 
as we walk up a bit, you'll see that there are these colorful houses. So I really love these colorful houses, and I think it's quite interesting. Whenever I'm here, I think about if the penguins prefer to live in a certain color house, because the penguins actually can see in color. So I always wonder if the penguins that live in the blue house pick that one because they like the color blue more. Maybe if one of you become a researcher one day, you can see if penguins actually like certain colors more. It'd be very interesting to find out. So you can see there are quite a few penguins at home pen here. A lot of them are kind of just lazing around happily, getting ready to go to bed soon. All right, let's head back inside the hospital. Oh, good. Okay, so we're back inside my office. That wraps up our lesson with Steve and Nona. So remember, our important lesson today is that we learned Steve and Nona are very tame. This means that they aren't scared of people. It's likely that they're not scared of people because someone went up to them in the wild and started feeding them or started trying to tickle them or take them home, and we learned important lessons. That one, we must leave things how we found them in nature. We must not take things out of nature back home with us because you could be taking something another animal needs to survive. Two, we must never go up to wild animals. If we see a wild animal that's really cool and you should enjoy looking at them, but don't pick it up and take it anywhere with you. And number three, we must never feed wild animals. All right, great. So those are our lessons for today. I hope that you enjoyed it. We're going to open up the floor to questions. Jesse, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so, so much, Tammy. That was wonderful. Uh, we got joined by a third class halfway through there, so welcome to Miss Rodriguez's class from Florida. Uh, first, we'll go to Miss McGee's class in Guelph. Well, you question. Colin, come here. Do you want to ask your question? Hey, we're coming. Why do they have lots of penguins there? Why do they have lots of penguins? Well, it's because uh, we are a penguin hospital. We're a seabird hospital. So we have lots of penguins here because they've gotten sick or they've gotten hurt. And we brought them here to make them better. So that's why we have lots of penguins here, because there are lots of penguins that need help. That's a good question. Thank you. It is. We'll go to Miss Golchinsky's class. How long do penguins' babies stay in their eggs before they hatch? That's a very good question. So it's different for different types of penguins. Penguins, it's normally about 40 days. And what's very interesting is when the penguin is ready to hatch, it's going to do something called pipping. It's going to break through. Just a little part of the egg. You're going to see just a tiny chip come off of the egg. When the chick starts doing that, it still takes another two days to get out of that egg. So they spend a long time actually hatching. We think a lot of birds just hatch in a couple seconds and they pop out and it's done. But for some birds, it takes them a long time to get out of the egg. That's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, it was a neat answer too. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Rodriguez's class. How can we adopt a penguin? Is that the question? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Um, so if you'd like to adopt a penguin, you can actually get hold of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And um, with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, you can adopt a penguin for $20. Um, and that goes towards the center to help us buy fish and medicines. And you get an adoption pack from South Africa to say thank you. 
So you get to name and adopt one of the penguins that you saw outside that are visiting the hospital because they don't feel very well. That's a very good question. Thank you. Standing. And that is a very cool classroom, by the way. Can I just say what a neat classroom that is? Uh, we'll go back to Ms. McGee's class. Go ahead, Ben. Um, oil on your wings. Hold on. Dan, come up here. One moment, sorry. Here, Bannon, come right up here, and you ask your question. Do oil? Do, do penguins? Do penguins have? Do penguins have oil on their wings? He's wondering if penguins have oil on their wings, and we were also wondering if they have feathers. Okay, okay. So penguins definitely do have feathers. They they are birds. So they they have um, a top layer of feathers and then underneath that they've got this really soft down actually. It's the softest thing I've ever felt. I can't even describe it. You know sometimes in winter you got those really soft warm blankets. That's what their down is like. And it's what they have to keep them super, super toasty. The feathers that are at the top, it's what keeps them waterproof. So the down is always dry, but those feathers at the top, they lock up so that the water doesn't get to the down. So yeah, they definitely do have feathers. Um, then they don't have oil on their wings, no, but they do have something really cool right by their tuchus, their tail, their butt. They've got something called a preen gland, right? So when they want to clean their feathers, they lift up their tails and they take their beak and they go to that gland and they go mmm, 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 all around the gland and they get this good oil from that gland and then they start rubbing it on their flippers and rubbing it on their feathers because it makes their feathers healthier. That's a very good question. Thank you. Excellent. We'll head back to Ms. Golchinsky's class. How long do you think the penguins stay underwater? Um, again, that depends on what kind of penguin they are. So in case some of you didn't hear, the question was how long can they stay underwater? It's how long they can hold their breath for. Now remember, penguins have lungs like we do. They, they don't breathe through gills like fish. So when they're swimming underwater, they have to take a deep breath and they swim and swim and swim and swim. So some penguins can be underwater for much longer than others because they can take much deeper breaths. Um, but for African penguins, it's a, it's probably about two or three minutes that they can swim underwater without needing to breathe, which is actually quite impressive because um, we can hold our breath underwater for a while. But as soon as we start swimming, then it becomes difficult. Think about a penguin hunting underwater, how fast it's moving, how much energy it's using. So that they can still hold their breath like that is really cool. They can also be out of the ocean for quite a long time. Um, there's some penguins that have been recorded being out at sea for, you know, two weeks or more just being out in the ocean. So it's really cool, actually. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. We'll head back to Mr. Rodriguez's class. Here. How many penguins are you taking care of? Right now, there are about 120 penguins in the hospital, and there are another 41 that live here. But we see one and a half thousand penguins every year and we treat about two and a half thousand seabirds a year so we don't only work with penguins we actually work with all different types of seabirds that's a very good question thank you wow, that's a lot of birds too uh we'll go back to Ms. McGee. okay amen go on up and ask your question okay. katie's coming <laughs> He's coming. He's remembering his question. Go right on up there. Have you always worked in the hospital? No, I haven't always worked in the hospital. Um, before I worked in the hospital, I was actually a high school math teacher. So I, I studied to become a math teacher, and I taught math for three years. Um, and I really enjoyed it. But then I saw this job with the penguins, and I was like, this looks like way more fun than math. So I am here doing that instead. But I do still love math. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I haven't always been here. I've been here for about two years. That's a very good question. Thank you. It's getting personal, too. I like it. All right, we'll go back to Ms. Golchinsky. Right there, How do penguins survive the cold? 
That's a good question. Um, so firstly, it's important to remember that not all penguins live where it's cold. There are 18 types of penguins. And out of those, only about four of them live in those very, very cold conditions. The rest of them, they live in countries like Australia, New Zealand, Peru, South Africa, along South America, and even the Galapagos Islands, which is close to the equator, or right in the middle of the earth where it's very, very hot. So not all penguins live where it's super cold, but those that do live where it's cold, they are normally quite a bit bigger, so their bodies are bigger, they've got more fat on their body to keep them super toasty. Their feathers are usually denser. This means that they have more feathers per section of skin. So they, um, it's, it's harder for them to get cold because they're so tightly wrapped up by their outer feathers. Um, and you'll find that some of them have some adaptions in their body that make them function a little bit differently to other types of penguins. So for emperor penguins, for example, the ones that are from the Happy Feet movie, they have this cool way that blood moves in their feet so that their feet are like these little toaster ovens, you know? And the reason why their bodies have made this is because they can't make nests for their eggs. Because if they put their eggs on the ground, they're going to freeze. They need to balance their eggs on their feet. So they need their feet to be like little ovens. Otherwise, it's way too cold. So some of them have these cool little adaptions that just make it easier for them to survive in that kind of condition. That's a very good question. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, and back to Ms. Rodriguez's class. What is the life span for a penguin? That's a very good question. So for African penguins, it's in the wild, it can be 20, 20 to 35 years if they make it to being an adult penguin. Um, a lot of the younger penguins die before they get their tuxedo and they're adults, but as soon as they're, they're old enough, they, they tend to survive much longer. Um, but if they live in captivity, so if they live in like a zoo or an aquarium, they can live quite a while. The oldest African penguin died when it was 42 years old in a zoo overseas. So they can actually have a pretty good innings if they're in the right setting. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. We'll do one last round through all three classes. So Ms. McGee. This is Nikki's class. Connor, you're out of how do, peng how do penguins know how to open doors? Um, so that's a very good question. Penguins actually don't know how to open doors because they don't have hands to help them open doors, but they are very clever. Um, luckily, they don't live inside little houses like we do, so they don't need to open or close doors like we would. Instead, they'll make their little burrows and they don't have front doors, so they just walk right in. If you've ever seen a penguin opening a door, like in a movie or something like that, maybe that penguin was taught especially how to open a door so they could do that really cool trick. But most of the time, and I have certainly never met a penguin that can open a door, but if you, if you know who that penguin is, you must send me the link because that sounds really cool. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, send us the link, too. That sounds amazing. All right, we'll go back to Ms. Kolchinsky's class. How do penguins communicate with each other? Communicate. That's a great question. Um, so how do penguins communicate with each other? They have body language like we do. You know, they puff up their bodies and they walk a certain way and they turn their heads. If they're snaking their head at you, they're saying, what are you doing? I'm snaking my head, I'm getting ready to bite you, you know, I'm showing you how limber my neck is so I can reach you quickly. Um, they bray as well, we practiced braying earlier, so the bray can mean different things. The bray can be angry, get away from me, I'm cross with you. The bray can be affectionate, you're my friend, I'm happy to be here. The bray can be romantic, it could be a mom and dad penguin and they're braying at each other because they really like each other a lot. So the brays can mean different things. It's all about context. It's, it's like with us as well. We can say a word, but if we say this word in different ways, we can mean it in different ways. Um, they also preen, they clean feathers. So they would clean feathers of another penguin if they really, really liked them or if they were related. So if it was a, a mom penguin and the baby penguin, you know, they clean each other's feathers to show that they like each other very much and they're related. 
um, and they also sometimes do like a bit of a head shake so they'll just tip their head down and it's not going like you know, shaking their head like that. And then that's also normally a very happy, affectionate thing. And sometimes they even puff as well. They'll just go like, <laughs> they'll puff out at you. It's quite cool um, to, to watch penguins and to try and communicate with them. That's a very good question. Thank you. All right. And last but not least, we'll go back to Mr. Rodriguez's class. Do you guys have a question for Tammy? Yeah. How long is Pregnancy. Uh, Ma'am, I'm going to need you to please repeat the question. I'm struggling to hear it. So if one of the educators can assist by repeating the question, thank you. I think it was how long is the pregnancy process? How long do they have the egg inside them? How long does the egg take to hatch? Oh, okay, so um, we we spoke about uh, we spoke about egg hatching before. That was about forty days, um, and you know something that's also interesting about eggs, and it's not something we really think about, is that eggs aren't always going to hatch. So a lot of the times, like if you have a chicken egg at home in your fridge, it, it's it's there isn't a, a baby chicken inside of there, and even if you put it under a little oven or something to try and heat it up. It's not going to hatch because the egg hasn't been fertilized. Um, so for penguins as well, they can actually wind up laying eggs that aren't fertilized. So sometimes um, we find penguins that have laid eggs and we pick them up and there's no baby penguin inside there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks so, so much for being with us here today, Tammy, and all the classes. So what we do at the end of every Hangout is I'm going to turn off, turn on all the mics of all the classes so you guys can say thank you to Tammy and Sankov for being with us here today. So if you guys want to go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Thank you. So thanks, 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 thanks for being with us here today. Uh, we hope to have all you classes exploring by the seat of your pants again soon. Tammy, thanks for being with us here today when you're not feeling well. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a nice day, guys.